T.S. Eliot, everybody know who T.S. Eliot was? Because if you don't, he's really worth reading. It was his 120th birthday yesterday, by the way. Uh, he was born in 1888 on September 26th. And in a poem called Little Gidding, which is part of the Four Quartets, he says, what might have been is an abstraction, remaining a perpetual possibility only in a world of speculation. Now this is very to the point, it's very precise, and I think it's very eloquent. Uh, by the way, T.S. Eliot was not your average poet, um, although I'm not sure what an average poet is, but he studied philosophy at Oxford as a Merton scholar. Uh, he graduated from Harvard. He was a trained philosopher, so when he writes his, his poems, there's philosophy in there all over the place. And he didn't just write a bunch of, oh, I feel like this or I feel like that. These lines are very succinct and they go to the heart of the matter about CFD and the hypothesis of equal a priori probabilities and a lot of other things. What might have been is an abstraction. So we can think all day long about what might have been. Remember that movie with Marlon Brando? He goes, I could have been a contender, but he wasn't. So he's thinking about something that's an abstraction in a world of speculation. I could have gone to a different college. I could have studied harder for that exam that I failed. That's all speculation. That doesn't qualify under Sagan's rules about measurement, observations, facts. The what might have been is never observed. Let's look at nature's code of law and order. The coin toss or the die throw, they're used to decide events in a quote unquote fair and unbiased manner. The idea is anything can come up at any time. So we're gonna throw this and we can get anything. My view is nature is not fair. Nature gave us a four and that's the only result we could have gotten. And I'm gonna show you uh, or explain to you why I think that in a minute. The scientist assumes that nature is indifferent, but I claim that's false. And therefore, I claim that when they say that randomness, chance, and probability are real, objective, and fundamental aspects of this world, and that's a direct quote out of a book on mathematics, I'm saying they're not real, objective, and fundamental at all. So when somebody says to you, you're a product of, ch of the chance combination of genes, I'm gonna say, no, 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 that's all wrong. Um, and it turns out it's based on an assumption. Uh, Stephen Hawking, everybody knows who he is. He's a very famous physicist, uh, Brian Greene. They see evidence of randomness where that evidence does not exist. By the way, Stephen Hawking is very famous for a book called A Brief History of Time. Remember that book? It was supposed to have sold about seven million copies. And uh, within publishing circles, that was known as the book that everybody bought but nobody read. So we're gonna look at Brian Greene in a minute, but basically there are hidden assumptions at work here. And our ability to predict the future does not mean that nature is random. Let me just read something from Stephen Hawking. He says in a lecture, this lecture is about whether we can predict the future or whether it is arbitrary and random. So somehow the idea we cannot predict, therefore it must be random. Now I don't think that quite computes, but that's how some scientists think. Now let's look at this last bullet here. According to the positivist mode of thought, if we cannot measure, we cannot know or predict, nor can nature know or predict. Now in quantum theory, we all know that we cannot predict what's gonna happen next. Somehow they've said nature cannot predict either. Now I think they, there's an unspoken rule in science that nature cannot be any smarter than we are. And I think this is intellectual arrogance at work. We can't predict, so nature's, we're stupid, so nature's stupid. Okay, we're dumb, so nature's dumb. It's not, we're dumb, but maybe nature's smart. I think we need to hold out the option. Maybe we are a little dumb, but nature's a little smarter than we are. So let's just take a look at how probability evolved, because at the very beginning, 
things like the, the die toss and the coin toss, they were assumed to be conveniences. And, and here we're back to Richard Feynman. When probability was first applied to such outcomes, it was considered to be a convenience, a way of dealing with very complex situations. And the reason he uses convenience here is because the classical physicists for hundreds of years thought, oh, we'll eventually be able to measure everything down to the infinite level and predict everything, in theory. There's a very famous physicist named Pierre Simon de Laplace who had a very famous statement about if we know something about the particle now, we can know everything about it later. So in theory, we can predict the future. Now quantum theory comes along at, at, at the beginning of the uh, 1900s and sort of upsets the apple cart, so to speak. So here we have Feynman again. The future, in other words, is unpredictable. That means that physics has, in a way, given up. If the original purpose was, and everybody thought it was, to know enough so that given the circumstances, we can predict what will happen next. Then he says, there is probability all the way back that in the fundamental laws of physics, there are odds. Now, we all know what odds thinking is. You know, what are the odds of getting a one when you throw this die? The odds are one out of six, right? That's odds thinking. It's what will happen next. Whereas frequency is how often do you get a one or a two or a three when you throw this thing multiple times? That's frequency versus odds. Now, when you go to a casino, you really don't care about long-term frequencies for red versus black on a roulette wheel or green. Because you know the roulette wheels, they always have that little green there. Otherwise, it would be a fair bet. And roulette is not a fair bet. No, no bet in a casino is called fair, except for the odds bet on a craps table, which we can get into later, or blackjack, which sort of changes depending on how the cards come out. But my point was you don't really care about what's going to happen in the long run. If you're down to your last dollar, you want to know with roulette, is it going to be black and red if you're going to play black and red? Because those are sort of like 50-50 bets, right? You don't care if it's 50% black in the long run and 50% red. You want to know what's going to happen next. And the casinos, the whole industry is built on the long run. No casino is going to bet the house on the next roll of the die. They won't do it because of the risk involved. If, they go, if you say to the casino executive, would you bet this whole casino on this coin being flipped? You know, heads or tails? The executive will say no. But if you say to the casino, can I play this game in the long run and will you, will, you, will you allow me to play this game in the long run as long as you have a little edge? They'll say, of course. If you go to a craps table, they, the craps table, they love it when you have money on the table. That's the whole thing. You have to put money there to win, obviously, and you don't want to lose. But they know that when you have money out on this, on this craps table, they have an advantage. And I mentioned the odds bet. If you take a bet on what's called the pass line or the don't pass, you are allowed to put a secondary bet on the side called the odds bet, which pays off at true odds. So when you take the, that odds bet plus the pass line bet together, they still have an advantage. But the odds bet pays off at true odds. And they don't put on their little table, you can take an odds bet, by the way. Okay, if you go to the craps table, you see minimum bet $10, and they don't say, please take the odds bet, because the odds bet pays off at true odds.